cool. All right. <laughs> Second book of the year. Yeah, crazy how time flies. Yeah. So this time around, we are going to do same as ever. And then the subtitle is Timeless Lessons on Risk, Opportunity, and Living a Good Life. I think that there's another subtitle um, in a different country, but I don't actually know what it is. <laughs> and then it's by Morgan Household. Um, yeah. Should yes, I'm a guy that wrote Psychology of Money. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, which we did, I think it was like about the third book that we did. Yeah, I think yeah. so. So, clearly we have a preference. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, I think, only the second book that he's written. Yeah, um, yeah. But he's a very relatable writer. He, yeah. He, quite easy to read. Yeah, no, he breaks it down. Um, simplicity, I mean, he talks about simplicity somewhere in the book as yeah. well. So, I mean, he he sticks to his words, yeah, you can exactly. say. <laughs> he sticks to his words. Yeah. Um, okay, should I give us a quick introduction? Yeah, go for it. So, Same As Ever was written by Morgan Household, the author of Psychology as Money. The book is a series of 23 short and timeless lessons on, as the subtitle suggests, risks, opportunity, and living a good life. It looks at the natural cycles of history and the lessons we can learn, while also focusing on the psychology of how humans act in the world. And that's pretty much it. Um yeah, it's quite a difficult one to actually give a good summary of because mm. the lessons are short little lessons and they each are quite distinct. D- yeah, different. They, yeah, they have that overarching theme of of like people acting in the world and yeah, living a good life and greed and all of those kind of things. But yeah, they're quite distinct stories. Yeah, I mean, even in the introduction, I mean, he does say you can read them independently of each other, so you can pretty much thread that at a board and exactly, <laughs> decide yeah. which chapter you want to go with. Um, yeah, which is really cool. Mm. It's helpful. Yeah. Especially with the tension spans that we have today. Like, slowly but surely as we read more, I'm like, my attention span is getting ever so slightly longer, but it's still not long. I should say, this was probably one book that I could read more than one chapter in a sitting, you mm. know, because the other books, I, I usually read a chapter and then, you know, let that simmer and digest for a bit before yeah. uh, moving on. But I mean, the way... Short and sweet and straight to the point. Um, mm. Again, that's why I'm saying the simplicity thing. Yeah. You know, he talks about it in the book, but yeah, I mean, I don't think there was a chapter longer than ten pages. Yeah, um, oh, there was one, but yeah, I think the, it was like the only one. Yeah, uh, mm. but most of them stuck to um, ten pages. Yeah, I think his publisher was even like confused at why the chapters were so short mm. and then he was like no i'll stick with it mm. i'm i'm hopefully remembering that correctly i think it is from one of the podcasts he did at some point mm, okay mm-hmm. but yeah should we dig into the intro introduction yeah okay. so this is a nice um little thing that he's uh, that he points out from this is from jeff bezos um he says yeah amazon founder jeff bezos once said that he often asks what's going to cha- that he is often asked what's going to change in the next 10 years and then he says i'm almost never asked the question what's not going to change in the next 10 years he said and i submit to you that the second question is actually the more important of the two um then household comments on this um Bezos said, it's impossible to imagine a future where Amazon customers don't want low prices and fast shipping, so we can put enormous investment into those two things. Um, the same is the same philosophy works in almost all areas of life. So, yeah, it, that general concept of we often focus on what's going to change, mm-hmm. but we should focus on what's not going to change yeah. because then as jeff bezos says he submits to us <laughs> that that's the more important question um yeah which is a really um helpful idea oh. and then <clears throat> then further than that on the next page um morgan comments so this is talking about a general philosophy the idea and the idea of all possible worlds and stuff like that. It's not really something that we need to get into, 
But he comments related to that. He says, philosophers have spent, have spent centuries discussing the idea that there are an infinite number of ways life could play out. And you just happen to be living in a specific version. It's, it's a wild thing to contemplate. And it leads to the question, what would be true in every imaginable version of your life? Not just this one. Those universal truths are obviously the most important things to focus on because they don't rely on chance, luck, or accident. And I think what he's getting at is we we often will do things or act in the world because of the influences that we've had around us, which is fine. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's just, it's fairly normal, can be even good. But then if you if you are to ask yourself, what are the things that if I was to imagine any different version of my life, that that would still be a core like tenant in my life? Those are the things that you should focus on. So, mm-hmm. for example, if, if I was to take myself, I would like to think that it doesn't matter if I was in any different version of reality, I would still find things like community and in in our case the church and um um and family and those kinds of things i would i would like to think that i would still find those as core pieces of of my world mm. and so then therefore those are the things that i should focus on um and maybe software development <laughs> is one of those things maybe not mm. um i really enjoy it but who knows mm. Yeah, and I mean, it's so interesting what you pointed out. And I mean, he, I think, in this, I mean, it's called the introduction. That's also where he introduces how history never changes, mm. you know. And he, I'm not quoting him directly, but, and I could be wrong, uh, but if I remember, um, he speaks about, um, how if you pay attention to history, you know, you actually going to be more informed about the future. Yeah. And I mean, um at the end of the book he talks about how he in the one year he told himself not to focus on focus anymore, but rather spend more time on re- reading history books. Mm. And the more he read up uh, up on history, the less worried he was about the future. You know, yeah, and, ironically. Yeah, uh, and um, he does talk about it in um, in the introduction that if you actually look at the history, you know, you kind of are well p- prepared of what's coming because mm. in most cases what happens in the future is a repetition of what happened before, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting, like there's various ways that it plays out. I mean, I think another book that we read was commenting on that kind of idea of forecasting the future based off of history. And there's certain types of forecasts that we can't actually make well. Mm. And I think, especially when it comes to the nuance of exactly what's going to happen when, Mm. those kind of forecasts, you're most likely fooling yourself Mm. if you can think you can do it perfectly because the world is so complex but when it comes to sort of more standard things and that's i think what he tries to focus on in this book like um things like the the fact that humans will tend to be greedy or Mm. things like um you will be surprised by what happens uh, when when if you think you know what's going to happen you'll be surprised like Mm -mm. that's those kinds of things um, are core pieces of of reality, and so then, yeah, th- those you those you can more easily forecast, mm. and hence again why he introduces Bezos there saying the more important question is what's not mm, going to change, change yeah. because like you said, then that allows you to predict well, mm. not necessarily on the micro level, but on that larger mm, scale. Yeah. Yeah. Should we head to chapter one? Yeah. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through 15, or sorry, 16 of these different stories, 16 of the 23. If you want to go through more, you're welcome to buy the book. <laughs> uh, it is a worthwhile buy. 
Um, but yeah, so the first one is hanging by a thread. And then each of these sections has a little sub note um, under it sort of summarizing the, the chapter or the idea. So the hanging by the thread says, if you know where we've been, you'll realize we have no idea where we're going. So he starts this off on page 10 with um, an interesting story. And I, I won't read through the whole story, but the general idea is that he, him and his friends, when they were younger, they used to love going skiing and they used to go and ski all the time. And then there was one time that was just like any other time they go to ski. It was a little bit more of a risky time um, because of, of weather and those kinds of things. But um, they went and they, him and I think two of, two, his, friends two of his friends go up and they go and ski and then they take some back path because at this point they're fairly experienced skiers. I don't know. I think they're still youngish, but they, they're pretty experienced skiers. I mean, I think they were coming from a ski competition or something like that. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah they, they skied a lot. <laughs> And so they go um, on one of the back routes and then... Which is out of bounds because yeah. of avalanches. Yeah, be out of bounds because of avalanches and, and that. Um, but so they go on this back route and they make it down to the bottom. And then Morgan decides that um, they like, cool, we, we want to go and do it again. Oh. And that was before I'd say, did you feel that? Because he was actually caught in one. On his... A small... Yeah, on yeah. his way down, but managed to get himself out of it. Yeah, like a mini avalanche. Mm. And then he gets to the... They all get to the bottom. And then he essentially says to them... Well, they say, like, we want to go again. And then he's like, no, I'm going to skip this one out. Which I don't think was normal for him. Yeah. So, long story short, um, unfortunately, the two of his friends pass away because they go again and then there's a massive avalanche and that and then based off of that he says then i began wondering why did i ski the backside with them once that morning and then decide on the second run a decision and then just decline on the second run a decision that almost certainly saved my life i've thought about it a million times and i have no idea he repeats again I have no idea. There's no explanation. I didn't think it through. I didn't calculate the danger. I didn't consult an expert. I didn't weigh the pros and cons. It was completely a fluke, a random and thoughtless bit of dumb luck that became the most important decision of my life, far more important than every other inter intentional decision I've ever made or will ever make. And yeah, it's... He says uh, on page 13, he makes a comment that events compound in unfathomable ways and that. And if you take those two statements, the idea that the decisions that you make have lasting impact, impact. that you can't forecast, um, it could be that you make a decision and that causes your death not and it's nothing that you could have planned for. Mm. Um, in this case, arguably, like they could have been like, okay, well, there's an avalanche. There was like a mini avalanche, and it was more dangerous and risky and things. Mm. But still, he, he declined to go. It wasn't really a major thing at the time, and then turns out to be one of the most important decisions of mm. his life. Mm. And and I mean, I I think back to often things like relationships or the company that you end up at or those kinds of things. Like it's just often is happenstance, mm. right place, right time mm. or wrong place, wrong time. If you don't enjoy your work or mm. those kind of things. But yeah, it's, we, you we made a decision at some point. <laughs> you know, yeah. During. And we think we know what we're doing, mm. but like he says, the, the summary, if you know where we've been, you realize that we have no idea where mm. we're going. Mm. If you realize that you survived that avalanche, you'll realize that you have no idea where these compound events will take you and these decisions that you make now mm. that seem fairly inconsequential, um, how consequential they will actually mm. be. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
on page 13, um, he also says here, and I think this is a very helpful one for just a lot of the general comments in the book. He says here, um, base predictions on how people behave rather than on specific events. Predicting what the world will look like 50 years from now is impossible. But predicting that people will still respond to greed, fear, opportunity, exploitation, risk, uncertainty, tribal affiliations, and social persuasion in the same way is a bet I'd take. So it kind of deviates a little bit from from that chapter, but it kind of ties back to that first idea that um, Bezos was saying as well. He knows people always want uh, faster shipping. They're not going to want slower shipping. Yeah. Mm. And so you can put a lot of time and effort into that because it's a safe bet mm. to take. People aren't going to change their minds. Yeah. That. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That reminds me of uh, once upon a time when when walked on a phone stand. And, uh, yeah. Um, the <laughs> uh, and many chats with... Uh, Jenna, she brought us to think that what we're actually trying to sell is convenience, which mm. was what everyone is trying at this point, which essentially turns into what business is saying that no way anyone want slower shipping in yeah. the next couple of years. We all want things now. Now, <laughs> yesterday. You know? um, yeah. Not that I don't see it as a good thing, but I it's just how the world, uh, the direction in which the world is going, mm. unfortunately, you know. Yeah. yeah. It is. But yeah. And, and that's why books like this are helpful because they kind of recenter your ways of thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, we often talk about a lot of the books that we read, they are not necessarily uh, very new, fresh ideas. It's sort of different ways of reframing a reminder yeah yeah um i mean we said that last last month with the other book that i mean it didn't give us any new ideas or things that we've never thought of but it just was in a dis- different perspective you know mm. those ideas that we've always had we've always known and things that we agree with as well yeah you know but they were just never detailed at that level for us to have that Oh, okay, you know, like mm. f- actually focus on them more, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, it's 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 quite interesting. Uh, yeah. uh, again, going back to what you said here, the whole you know one day things yesterday thing. It's, <laughs> yeah. an, it's an idea that we we know and you know we all possess. Sadly, uh, but yeah. yeah, it's been said again, and you're like the truth in that is you know striking. Yeah. <laughs> And those are things that, like, it's not going to change. Yeah. Something very drastic would have to happen mm-hmm. for something like that to change on a global level. Yeah. It could change on an individual level, mm-hmm. but on a global level, it's unlikely that yeah. that people aren't going to want things right now and, and want more than they wanted yesterday. Mm. I mean, it talks about late in the book about how companies always strive for efficiency, but they don't know that you know, a small deviation to that can cause a hot of the whole system that was once thought of as the most efficient system, mm. you know. And you strive for efficiency without being control of all the moving parts that actually allow for something to be delivered, you mm. know. Um, yeah, and I mean, think about uh, even for Jeff Bezos, you know, what if there's, an, I know we're moving into electric, but, what if there's a fuel crisis all of a sudden? Yeah. You know, then it would be hard for him to deliver things overnight, mm. you know. Um, but again... They bought you, a lot of electric cars no, recently. The, I, know, I know that, that you mentioned that. that that's why I mentioned that. Electric trucks. <laughs> I think it's by Rivian. Anyway, somewhat um, irrelevant. Um, but yeah, that's why I mentioned to say that there can just be a change in something, mm. you know, that as much as that's what your business is built on and strives to do that. If just one of the moving parts mm. slightly deviates, then that changes the whole course of action, you know, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Hmm. 
But, but yeah. Yeah, no, I think we will touch on that. Um, yeah, I'm sure we will. Um, again, then going on to the next one. So that's the risk is what you don't see. So this is a got a really good story, but just to give the summary before, we're very good at predicting the future, except for surprises, which tend to be all that matter. I think this it kind of ties a little bit back into the previous chapter. They kind of overlap in their idea. Um, but yeah, so so then um, the story that he gives here, or one of the <clears throat> one of the stories is about a, an astronaut. And so the summarized version is that um, they're busy testing a space suit and they go into space and or like just before sp- they, you get to space. So they're like right on the cusp. And then um, that's a really dangerous mission because it's still it's back in the it's back in 1961. So they go and um, it's on a balloon flight. So I mean, it's not as dangerous as rockets and that, but still. So they test out the spacesuit, and everything goes really well. And they make it to the the uh, cusp of space, and then they come back down. And then they land safely in the ocean. And then it says, yeah, he, land, he, landed safe, uh, he landed in the ocean as planned, where the helicopter was to pull him to safety. But there was a small mishap. While connecting himself to the helicopter's rescue line, um, Prather, is, which is his name, uh, slipped, falling into the ocean. This shouldn't have been a big deal. And no one in the rescue helicopter panicked. The spacesuit should have been watertight and buoyant. But since Prather had opened his faceplate, he was now exposed to the elements. Water rushed into his suit and he drowned. So you go through all of this planning and you achieve this incredible accomplishment. And then bam, out of nowhere, something goes horribly wrong that you couldn't have predicted um, and it's just that's the kind of thing that happens oh. for good or for ill. Yeah, um, mm. it happens. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I think just before you move on to the next point, I mean, later on on that sh- on that same page, it goes a financial advisor, Carl Richard says, risk is what's left over after you, after you think you've thought of everything, and yeah. which is exactly that. It's like. V- for the mission at hand, they had thought of everything. The suit mm. was airtight and all that kind of stuff. And upon landing, I mean, he was like, okay, I'm now done. I'm not on solid ground yet, but I'm back on earth and everything. I can actually open my, you know, first plate. You yeah. know? And just because there's an order, that was the easy entry for that. Something that they would mm. they, they hadn't thought of. You yeah. Know? Um. I mean, to think further to me when I read that, I like, I'm sure now they have some sort of quick release of the suit to just fall off. You mm. know, if met, you know, with that. But again, at the time, the mission was to survive, going just before to leave the Earth's atmosphere and mm. back. And what was was the one thing that was supposed to happen to sit in there to be a- airtight? You yeah. Know? And if you think about it, if something enters an airtight thing, it has no room to yeah. escape. But they didn't think of that if water was to enter the suit, then, mm. you know, yeah, to get rid of the burns of the suit. Um, yeah, like he says, um, we aren't good at predicting the future. We we think that we are. Hmm. Or, I mean, he says we are very good at predicting the future. It's like different situations you can and can't be. Um but even in those cases that we are good at predicting the future, there's, there's always, the surprises. There's yeah. the the risk defined by that that oh. guy. Um, the things that we don't think of when we've thought of everything. Think, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Expectations and reality. So that's the next um, sort of chapter story, and it says that the first rule of happiness is low expectations. Oh. I think this is one that I would like to draw into my head for un- until I pass. Like, it's just something I've got to keep reiterating. Because if we get that right, then 
we can live much happier lives. Mm. Um, and it's not to be like, be like, oh, everything is terrible. Is mm. That's not what he means by low expectations. It's just like, don't try and live up to the Joneses. Mm. I think what another way to put that, it was just that we... We rob ourselves of happiness as a result of disappointment, and the disappointment comes when our expectations are not met. Mm. You know, that's yeah. essentially, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> and expectations aren't met normally when we're comparing ourselves to others. Mm. Not only that, it's in more aspects than that, I believe. Um, it's just even setting ourselves goals. I'm, I'm not saying set low goals, but I've just said, more realistic goals. You know, I think we are at a point mm-hmm. where we know our abilities, et cetera, et cetera. And if we set unrealistic goals, it grows an expectation at the end of the day, you know. Uh, and you won't achieve them and you will be disappointed <laughs> that you didn't achieve them. Yeah. Um, so set a goal that's attainable. I know that sounds bad, but I think it's... Um, I mean, one can say then, how do we improve? Uh, and I remember something um, from years back. Again, from I think it was I forget what her name was. I think it was like Bev or something from the telecom. Uh, but anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but our innovation days. <laughs> I, I don't know why they keep coming back to that. <laughs> but it is she, she mentioned something about, um, and I think the book also mentions it at some point of how when we actually reach our goal, then we become complacent. And yeah. that room we leave after that is actually where disaster comes. Mm. And I remember her saying that plan or your achievements should be set after your goal. So for instance, you don't say, let's say you, you want to run... 10 Ks, you know, you yes, that might be the goal, but you should actually say, I want to be able to run 11 because 10K is right at it. And who says that maybe someone said it before that you actually might somehow fall short. Mm. So you should actually look past what your goal is. So like, for instance, for a business, if you're business, if your goal is to sell a certain number of units, overshoot that a bit. Mm. You know, just it then gives you that wiggle room at the end of the day. But yeah, um, I, don't I, know. Know. I, I both agree with you, and, and I'm confused <laughs> because if you think about we we both saying we sh- shouldn't have those shouldn't have high, high expectations, high but, but overshoot. Should. <laughs> but yeah, but I, I think at the end of the day, it goes back to the atomic habits thing yeah. with James Clear as well. So where you. You, you want to do things small. Yeah. So even if if you, for example, want to overshoot, if you say, I'm going to try for this mm. and you overshoot, you like sort of overestimate, mm. I think that's good in some ways, but you, for the the thing that you're actually yeah. wanting to, to get and the thing that you're going to hold yourself to, don't make it too far away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather do it in small little chunks. The, uh, y- if I rephrase what I said, I know I kind of made that convenient. What should, um, your goal should be within the bounds of what you can actually do in the end. Oh, okay. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. So if, you, if you're fairly confident that you can run a 10K because you generally fit, yeah. then that that can be your goal, but you're trying to achieve the 11K, but you your goal is... Is ten because okay. you you confident? I mean, like for me, the goal is definitely <laughs> a lot. For, it's like a hundred meters. It's, yeah, yeah, we both. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. <clears throat> okay, then. Um. So carrying on with the expectations thing, the the one of the starting things that he says on that page is, your happiness depends on your expectations more than anything else. So, in a world that tends to get better for most people most of the time, an important life skill is getting the goalposts to stop moving. It's also one of the hardest. Yeah, that's the different way of saying that that same thing of low expectations. Just 
getting the goal posts to stop moving. And I think especially when it comes to economic wealth, if one is fortunate enough to be in a situation where you can afford the things that you you need and a little bit more the things that you want don't let those wants keep rising mm-hmm. and don't let them feel like they are actually yeah. needs because like i know. mean i know this is different but that's usually what i ask people when they're like no i'm not unhappy with my job i want to earn more money what mm. no, no, no. and i always go like what's the cutoff because if you leave it that open ended that I want more money, you will always want more money. Yeah. You know, you might actually be earning more than you should, but just because in your head you have this notion that I need to earn more money, you never earn enough. And mm-hmm. like you're saying, those the the ones who continue creeping in that you, you might earn twice as much as you earn when you started working, but you might pour a live in a better life when you started working than you do mm. now because you've just filled you know your the number of ones just because you see that the money is there mm. and the more you think of oh I want that I want that I want that when, which you actually don't need mm. um, yeah yeah it's a dangerous trap to fall into yeah and we so, we yeah. almost always do end up mm. falling into that trap like I don't know. I feel like this is the case for most people. Um, hence the same as ever. But I know for me, for sure, it's something that I have to constantly work on. Mm. Like I have to constantly remind myself like, okay, like just check the level that you are wanting to be at and try and keep that consistent. Um, and try not to like... If you get more money in, then like either invest it or like give it away or something. Do but don't don't just like keep on rising mm-hmm. your your standard of living forever. Like get it to the point where like you don't have to live in. Oh, Peter Singer might disagree, but <laughs> the you don't have to live in sort of a poverty or things like that if you can afford not to mm. but don't go and like paint your walls with real gold or something like it's just <laughs> that's where I draw the line at least <laughs> <laughs> so use silver to paint your walls <laughs> oh, um, I disagree the, with Jim <laughs> I, kidding. I wouldn't <laughs> my walls go <laughs> Um, so on on page thirty one, there's a related thing that um, Peter. I don't know how to pronounce his name, his surname, but Kufman, Peter Kufman, CEO of Glen Glen Air, um, one of the smartest people you'll ever come across, once wrote, "We tend to take every precaution to safeguard our material possessions because we know what they cost." But at the same time, we neglect the things that are much more precious because they don't come with a price tag attached. The real value of things like our eyesight, our relationships, our freedom can be hidden to us because money is not changing hands. Mm. Yeah. Like I often say, it's another helpful reminder. When we think that something is valuable, we must just take a step back um for me maybe uh, if i want some new technology or something versus going out to dinner with jamie which is more important mm. it might seem at the time that the technology is port- more important and i can argue with a lot of uh, for a lot of reasons like no it'll help me grow and do this in the mm. future and stuff like that and there's reasons and um yeah you don't want to stray too far in either direction but we often neglect that those relational things or the value of, like he says, our site mm-hmm. and, and that because we so focused on, mm-hmm. on other things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, before I move, that's just like a sad reality that something comes across as important just because there's been an exchange of money. You know, like mm-hmm. that's what's deemed more important than, like you said, like you 
fostering your relationship than you saying, I need this because, you know, it might be true, but at the same time, it might I cannot be the case because you actually have other technologies that can easily do the same thing yeah. that, you know, they can do. Um, but just because there's no exchange of money in growing a relationship, you know, um, you feel like, no, that's actually less important. I can do that at any time, mm. you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, which I feel is sad, you know. It's the same as, you know, the whole people not valuing actually meeting people, you know, than just staying behind their phones and stuff like that, you know, mm. like to see no value in that. You know, if they let's say play games and earn money through that, they'd rather do that than go out to hang out with, you know, others yeah. in person. You know. The, there's the comedian, I'm trying to remember his name. Kevin James, so he's got a new thing on Netflix, yeah. and he he gives this funny sort of example that um, what you were saying reminds me of. Yeah. There's a his son. I don't know if he's joking about it or or if it's actually real, but he's basically saying like, yeah. So he his son convinces him to his son's been playing a lot of games and he's trying to get his son to stop playing games and then um to do like exercise out in the world eventually his son convinces him to buy an oculus like Mm. one of those virtual reality headsets so he gets the virtual reality headset because his son says like no like it's very cool because um it's 3d and then you can do all these exercises and stuff like that and so you can i can keep myself healthy healthy Mm. like that so then um, eventually he he comes across his son and his son's just like standing blankly in the kitchen with his oculus on. And then he stands for a bit and then he moves his hands around and then he sits down. And he stands a bit and he moves around and then he sits down. And so Kevin's like, what? on earth is like happening and he's like starting to get annoyed with, with his kid because he's like he said that he's gonna use it use it for exercise and then every now and again he gets up and then he moves his hand around and he gets excited because he's like oh he's gonna <laughs> exercise but then it's not anyway long story short it turns out that he was just all that he was doing is in the virtual reality game he was pretending he was playing as a cashier in the game <laughs> And he's like, why couldn't you just get a job in real life <laughs> and do that in real life? Be a cashier in real life, but you want to play the game instead. And it's just funny how we, like we distort what, what's meaningful mm. or these other things. Mm. Um, but yeah, anyway, somewhat unrelated, <laughs> but it was just funny. Yeah. 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 Um, shall we go on to the best story wins? Yeah. Okay, so this is another... Um, idea that Morgan harps on a lot for good reason. Um, I think it's even in it, in the psychology of money, it's, there's a similar idea, but some uh, stories are always more powerful than statistics. So he says there on page 51, the best story wins, not the best idea or the right idea or the most rational idea. Just whoever tells a story that catches people's attention and gets them to nod their heads is the one who tends to be rewarded. And then he goes on to say, people are busy and emotional, and a good story is always more powerful and persuasive than uh, ask called statistics. Yep. I don't think we want to believe that that's true. No, uh, but. So uh, when I was reading this, I actually agreed with what he was saying um, through the, this chapter to be like, I don't know about you, but if you meet a character that articulates themselves very well, mm-hmm. you tend to gravitate towards those people than people that struggle to do so. And I mean, he gave a few examples that, yeah. you know, how like th- there are these brilliant people out there and just because they might be maybe introverted, don't speak out, et cetera, et cetera, people will never value their input than mm. the loud pieces, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, and sadly, we're in a world where a lot of those loud pieces share misinformation and 
just mm. because they're able to articulate themselves well enough, then they're able to get a massive following because yeah, you know they're able to, like you said, tell their story really well, you know, and yeah, it's it's just unfortunate, but. I guess it's something that people need to then practice, you know. And I mean, it goes back to the whole thing of simplicity and complexity, you know. It's, and it kind of opposes this to be like, when someone tells something plainly, it's not the best story. Mm. But when it's complex, yeah, it, you know, captivates you. But at the same time, it's like, that's not actually what's needed. Yeah. You don't need to make something complicated, but unfortunately our natures gravitate to something that's complicated because then someone will tell a longer story around mm. that and unpack what it actually is. Mm. You know, yet simplicity isn't the best story. Yeah. You know? uh, that's just one way I looked at it. But yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the the way that we understand people and the world around us is generally through stories. Mm. So, I mean, as kids, we get raised and we get told little stories Please. and things like that and we learn things and we find it very mm. engaging. And then as adults, we think, okay, cool, that story time is done. Maybe sometimes I'll read some fiction mm. and that's a story, but the rest of it isn't. But actually, a, a very large portion of the things that we interacting with are, are stories mm. about different things. Um, the, the reason why we, um, I don't know, just to use a silly example, why we brush our teeth is because of a story and, and we use toothpaste and things like that. I don't know what they used to use in the past. They must have used some other thing. Sort. Um, Salt, really. Yeah. Salt, and I know that they might have used charcoal. Or, yeah, salt as well. But oh, yeah, it could be. But yeah, yeah that's potent. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the reason why we do certain things, maybe brushing teeth isn't a great example, but is because we told a story about the different aspects of it. It's not that we understand the um, biochemistry of the toothpaste and the coating, this and that, and brushing off the bacteria i mean the plaque and that kind of thing it's just we we have some understanding of how things are mm. that's a, a sort of a narrative and often the narratives line up mm. to what reality is but it's still the the details are kind of missing to us and if we were to be told a different story um i don't know to use a, a carrying on with a toothpaste example if we, we were told that, no, it's not toothpaste that we should be using, but, I don't know, a diluted version of bleach, which, I don't know, maybe that wouldn't actually be as dangerous as it seems. Maybe it would be very dangerous. <laughs> Who knows? But we we told that that's what we should use, and then we use it for 10 years, and then we develop cancer in our mouths or something like that because it's not good for us. Um, We wouldn't like we would have probably just carried if someone was convincing enough and there was enough mm. weight behind the story mm. we would probably just be brushing our teeth with that because mm. we don't know all the details mm. and we can't mm. um so we convinced by mm. story mm. which is fine it's how we need to the world is too complex to not do mm. that i mean but, there's, <clears throat> there's a section the whole i know i kept related and back to the complexity, simplicity thing, um, where I think it was like doctors or professors gave some man like a rare diagnosis just because it was a more interesting story mm. to the one guy that said, no, the guy's fine. Yeah. You know, but people opted for the rare <clears throat> diagnosis, actually cleared the guy for an operation only to find that he was, he was fine all along. Yeah, you, know, you didn't need the operation. And again, it's the same thing. The story had more weight. Like, you'd be like, oh, it's this red disease. It's more intriguing than, yeah. you know, it's same thing of, you know, lung cancer. The the best way to eradicate lung cancer is people 
to stop smoking. Mm. But that's not as interesting as people finding the cure of lung cancer. You exactly. Know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a. We trick ourselves into thinking we're doing things for the right reasons mm. and that, when actually we're just doing it because the story around it is interesting mm-hmm, yeah. or the story that we can then tell e- tell others is interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over some of the things and just into page 60, which is... Um, so it says here, the visa founder, D. Hock, once said, new ways of looking at things create much greater innovation than new ways of doing them. You'll get discouraged if you think every new book has to be about an original idea or that every new company has to sell a brand new invention. There's so much more opportunity if you see the world like Yuval Noah Harari. Um, that's not what you, that it's not what you say or do, but how you say it and how you present it. So he, Yuval wrote a, a book called Sapiens, which was a, a very widely sold um and he his ideas and things weren't new they were just presented well and so he became extremely popular for these almost like people attributed him with this new knowledge but actually what he did was just rewrite it in a more digestible form um but it's interesting the whole visa founder commenting on new ways of looking at things creates much greater innovation. And we'll we'll touch on it later, so I won't dig into it too much. But we often think that innovation is about... Um, it's about just thinking and then coming up with a completely new idea. But often it's actually just taking various narratives and creating a new story from that. Mm-hmm. And that might lead to an invention or this or that. But it's not... It's not that those things just come out of the blue. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's part from the same section that talks about the light bulb to say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In it. Yeah, yeah. We can, we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll get definitely there. get there. We'll, we'll it's a good there. one. <laughs> yeah. So, point of the story is, best story was. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, should we head to too much, too soon, too fast? Oh. Okay, so page 80, let me flip over there. Okay, so um, the, the, the section is called, or the, the chapter is called Too Much, Too Soon, Too Fast. And then the subtitle or the subsection, sub-summary, <laughs> is a good idea on steroids quickly becomes a terrible idea. And then it opens up with Warren Buffett once joked that you, can, you can't make a baby in one month by getting nine women pregnant. pregnant. <laughs> So, I mean, the chapter kind of goes on to to say a bunch of different things, but the the broad idea is like often we try to do things way too fast, mm. and we don't let things take the time that they take, and um, that is to mm. our own or our company or whatever's mm. downfall um, that we don't we try to make the baby in one month when yeah. it just like it cannot work. It does not work like that. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it also reminds. I think I forgot what the section is about how the whole compounding thing of how everything takes a while, but it takes it's so easy to then destroy. Mm. That, you know, um, you have to work hard to build your character and who you are, but it's you can easily destroy that by yeah. one wrong decision. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's true. Mm. Yeah, the, the, it's not a balanced equation. Mm. You know, the peace and war thing is the same. Um, the, in that chapter, they comment where the idea of peace, in order for there to be a peaceful world, everyone needs to be peaceful. Mm. In order for there to be um, war, to break away from that peace there's just one or one small group of people yeah. that need to be really aggressive and cause a lot of nonsense and then a war can start. Oh. But yeah. Um, so g- going back to the too much, too soon, too fast. Um, 
he gives a really nice story. There's two stories and they are some of my favorite just because they're simple mm. and it's like it's the whole wisdom tale kind of vibe. Um, but so he talks about trees that grow fast and trees that grow slow. Yeah. And he says that when trees go f- grow fast, um, they it, it's really helpful for them because they can get more sunlight than the other trees and that. So if a tree grows fast, um, it turns out well and it can keep on growing much faster and it's all great. But then what ends up happening is that tree can then rot more easily mm. because the wood isn't as dense because it's spent um, all of its resources um, growing rather than creating a dense foundation. Mm. Whereas if you compare it to um, oak trees and things like that, the whole idea of an oak tree, small seed, and then over time it grows into this massive tree that's normally very sturdy and stable and oak wood is expensive because it takes so long to grow. Mm. But it's also like prized because of the fact that it's so dense. Mm. And the reason it's so dense is because it takes that time. Mm. It doesn't try and rush things. Um, And then it ends up being a really hardy tree, Mm. which humans can then cut down. (laughs) (laughs) But so he says that story, which that idea of the opposite of too much too soon, but just again, letting things take the time that Mm. they take. And then he goes on to another story, which I think is really um, helpful as well. With the fish. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know if you want to tell it. No, all. no. But, yeah, it. I mean, so that, that fish story is... Apparently, you can put fish into warm water and cold water. And if you put them into cold water, they will grow slower. And if you put them into warm water, they will grow faster. Um, and what they did was they, they did, a, I guess, an experiment of sorts... So they put some fish in cold water, put some fish in warm water. The fish in cold water grow slower, fish in warm water grow faster. And then they took those fish and they put them in, I guess, a normal temperature order. Mm. And then um, they ended up growing to the same size. But the fish, I can't remember what the stats were, but something like the fish that were in the warm water, i.e. the ones that grew up faster, died 20 to 30 percent faster, faster or earlier than um than the ones who were in the cold water and the reason i don't know if this is fact or speculation but the the reason was because when you are growing fast you dedicating all of your resources towards growth and so you don't have that much resource that that many resources to go and do cell repair and things like that but then for the fish that took the right amount of time to grow um, or grew slower, they could then focus more on cell repair and things like that. And so they don't end up forming, I guess, whatever the fish equivalent of cancers and those kinds of things are um, because they have, again, a more sturdy base mm. to work off of. So the moral of the story is... Take cold showers. <laughs> no, <laughs> cold plungers, but... you know. <laughs> Are we advocating for cold plungers? It's the in no. thing. Now. <laughs> yeah. My dad actually takes them and he says it's, it's been good. I mean, he, he's taught us a few times to go to the oceans at the break of dawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it is helpful. Um, mm. Even if it's just to like shock your body a bit. Mm. But apparently it's healthy. Yeah. But, hey. <laughs> um... Cool. Shall we head over to when the magic happens? Mm. So, when the magic happens, the subtitle is stress focuses your attention in ways that good times can't. Mm. I don't know. I don't think I've ever experienced that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they the, the did list down a few examples that, I mean, if you think about the some of the greatest innovations came in times that were not so pleasant. Mm. Um, yeah, the Great Depression in that mm. 1930s. Mm. Yeah. It, I think what is, I mean, the ideas that it's trying to put, if you're in a level of stress, you enter some sort of survival mode, you know, and mm. which doesn't happen when you're living comfortably. 
Um, yeah. I think when you're comfortable, you become complacent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and mm. you know. Um, but yeah, uh, it's quite interesting idea. Um, yeah, I think we often want to fight against the the stresses and that of the world, mm. where it's not. I think the constant stress is dangerous. Yeah. No, but having that bit of stress can actually be really helpful. Mm. Um, finishing off a project or doing different things. Yeah. Deadlines, eh? Hey? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. Are you going to, are you looking up something there? Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, it was just this point that was made uh, by the founder of uh, Shopify. It says, I think, can become truly res- resilient when everything goes right. Mm. You know, um, you need those ups and downs to yeah. kind of form that resilience. You know, you mm. to stand your ground to show that you c- can't be shaken. You know, it something needs to go through the test of time. Yeah, you know, for that to happen. Um, yeah, um, yeah, because we can't. If we don't go through those difficult things, then we aren't able to to build up that like tolerance or know how or whatever it might be to be able to withstand those kinds of things in the future. And then if we can't withstand them in the future, then we'll fall at those times. Mm. So yeah, in, in order to be resilient, you know, you have to face difficulty. Mm. It's a it seems like it's just a natural law. Yeah. Mm. Should we head to overnight tragedies, long-term miracles? Yeah. So I think this was um, part of that um, chapter. So I'll start off with the um, part of sorry part of the chapter where you, that you were referencing earlier. I'll start off with the summary though. So good news comes from compounding which always takes time, but bad news comes from loss in confidence or ca- uh, catastrophic error that can occur in the blink of an eye. So, yeah, like you said earlier, and it's a good point to remember because reputations and those kind of things are very hard to build up, yeah, yeah. but can be taken away very, very quickly. Ooh. So, Ooh. yeah. I mean, I think there was <clears throat> somewhere where he lists a few companies that, you know, were doing so well and just just one thing mm. and they were, went in disarray, you know. Um, yeah, and it's like the Amazons of their day kind of size companies. It's mm. not small companies. Yeah. Um, but yeah. The, the quote here from Yuval Noah Harari is also here on page 130. Um, To enjoy peace, we need almost everyone to make good choices. By contrast, poor choice, a poor choice, by just one can slide, by just one side, sorry, (laughs) can lead to a war. Uh, And then he, um, Morgan comments, the idea of of complex to make, simple to break is everywhere. Yeah, like we were speaking about earlier. All right, should we? Yeah, and I mean, even <clears throat> the the line that comes after that, the whole the idea of complex to make and then simple to break, it goes about how construction requires skilled engineers and demolition requires only a sledgehammer. Mm. And there's lots of examples like that. Yeah. Yeah, building things is difficult. Destroying them is easy. Just easy. Hook up explosive and yeah. everything is flat and you know it took years to build even building the explosive is complicated mm. and blowing it up is it's, easy it's <laughs> 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 yeah um the the next one is tiny and magnificent so when little things compound into extraordinary things mm. and there's a few little comments that he makes on the first page so the one is a 2010 Yale study showed that one of the leading causes 
of increased obesity is not necessarily people eating larger meals. It's eating more small snacks throughout the day. Uh, and then he says, yeah, most amazing things happen when something tiny and insignificant compounds into something extraordinary. Yeah. I don't know how many times we've touched on the idea of compounding, compounding and small things. And I still don't think I put as much into that idea as I should. Mm -hmm. But I think even with us, like the whole idea of us starting to read and doing little things like that. And then that slowly leading to the podcast and, and getting better at reading over time, both of us. And I, th I think those kinds of things, it's not like there's anything incredible about what we're doing. Mm. But those small things compound into something that's really helpful, mm. um, which yeah, is just it's a very cool thing to to see retrospectively, mm. but difficult to <coughs> believe looking it, forward. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, it's again, it, it's same source. It's just the, like the discipline that it comes with mm. with it, you know. Um, knowing, I mean, <coughs> there have been a few times where you know hacked a few things, but I mean, it's just. You know, in I mean, there's no reward, no incentive. I mean, there's a chapter of incentives, <laughs> but yeah. there's no incentive for us to to read through the books. But mm. it's like we want to actually read and get through the books. And I mean, we've, I mean, there've been some books that I'm like, okay, this is probably not for me, and I've actually ended up enjoying. You know, mm. I mean, psychology of money is one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't like. Um, reading about money and that kind mm. of stuff. But, I mean, it was helpful. I need to go back to it. Um, but, yeah, it just also taught me not to easily dismiss certain topics. You know, you if you don't know, you don't know, but try and educate yourself mm. in those areas, you know. And, I mean, years ago, I wouldn't have remotely thought, you know, like, I'd read as much as I have in the last year, mm. you know, um, just, it was just that one thing I thought like, no, n never going to be my thing. Never, yeah. not my thing. <laughs> yeah. You mm. know, um, but I think we, we surprise ourselves and again, it goes, you know, tiny and I mean, we, we started really tiny. We, we used yeah. to read like a chapter a week and like this guy, I mean, we, we, like really diving deep into books, like really yeah. unpacking them to the core, but it was very inefficient, you know, like mm. we, we got nowhere. I mean, it took us probably a year and some change to get through Atomic Habits. Yeah. You know, um, same with 4,000 words. I think we did two four books. Yeah. Uh, 4,000 weeks, sorry. Yeah, it took us, I think, two years to do two books. Yeah. And we're like, like that, we're yeah. like, nah, something, <laughs> something's got to change. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, to then last year to read maybe close to 10 books. Yeah. Roughly you know? once a month, I think it was yeah. ja January. And I think January and December, December we, yeah, yeah, we kind of, so we read. Ten books, yeah, you know, um, yeah, yeah. No, it's really it's cool to see, and it it goes to show you like a lot of the people who, again, not that this is like a super successful thing or anything like that. We don't we're more doing it for keeping ourselves accountable, oh, yeah. which is really awesome. But I'm um, reflecting on people like Jeff Bezos and those kind of people. They genuinely doesn't seem like they are like absolutely in extraordinary people mm -hmm. they're just people who consistently over and over and over again all the time for decades push the, the ideas forwards mm -hmm. slowly and incrementally um and they drive they try and drive on the core things that humans tend to to do and that and then um often that's the thing that gets them to their with luck and all kinds of different things oh. but it's just that compounding that gets someone that is actually a normal person into a position like that um i mean i, I don't know if it was the psychology of money or a different book 
that commented on Warren Buffett's wealth oh. and how like the vast proportion of his wealth came from his last his last couple years oh. because of compounding. Oh. Um, and now he's known as he was never doing like terribly oh. as far as I understand, but it's the reason the rewards came on me years after exactly and it's not the the thing is he it's not like he's some mastermind um price predicting mm-hmm. machine mm-hmm. he's just like okay well if we look on the sort of broad spectrum what's going to happen to the market mm-hmm. okay i'll put my money and leave it there for mm-hmm. a long time mm-hmm. uh, last comment on it is that i think that they were saying something like the, I think it was in this book. The Warren Buffett and, and Charlie Munger, um, a lot of the things that they invested in, they still have those same investments. Um, like years and years later, mm-hmm. they still, I mean, Munger's now passed away recently, but th- they still have their company, I think it's Berkshire, Berkshire and Hathaway, Um still has those same investments in Mm. companies like coca-cola and that i assume they still have coca-cola um and they've just kept them Mm. for ages yeah yeah, and i mean i don't know if it was this chapter where it talks about how such people that are in for the long run actually are not as famous as this new age of investors that you see now mm. that, has, that play the market, you know, because that's what people are into, you know, like the instant gratification, the instant reward, the, yeah. the long-term investments, you know. Yeah, we want those those dopamine hits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, should we go on to the next one? Yeah. Okay, so the next one is casualties of perfection. Um, the thing it says here is there's a huge advantage to being a little imperfect. Um, so on page 118, they also say here, um, psychologist Amos Tversky uh, once said that the secret to doing good research is always to be a little bit underemployed. You waste years by not being able to waste hours. A successful person who a, per, a successful person purposefully leaving gaps of free time on their schedule to do nothing in particular can feel inefficient, and it is. So not many people do it. But Tversky's point is that if your job is to be creative and think through tough problems, then time spent wandering around a park or aimlessly lounging on a couch might be your most valuable hours. A little inefficiency is wonderful. Every person I've worked with, um, every person I've worked with, comes back from vacation saying some variation of the same thing. Now that I had some time to think, I've realized dot dot dot. With a few days to clear my mind, I figured out dot dot dot. While I was away, I got this great idea mm. dot dot dot. So, yeah, just the the idea of blocking out our time perfectly and never having time to just think is actually probably less helpful than having that flexibility. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think like reading this, I mean, it's, um, I guess on a business perspective, it's, it's hard for you to tell your boss and whatnot to be like, I need to block out three hours a day just to think and whatnot mm. and do nothing, you know. But, I mean, like reading that, it's it was interesting to say we do figure out things way outside of the our co-working hours. I mean, mm. there are times when you're like, I mean, I know I've had instances where I'm getting ready for work and like not knowing that you're thinking about this problem and then you're like, oh, this might be a solution. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not, that's not my co hours. I cannot then go back to work and, and log, log, those hours. log those hours that I was, <laughs> oh, I was showering and my showers usually take this and you know and yeah. all that, you know. But 
you encourage that's encouraged and frowned upon than you actually coming forward and be like I'll take this time hmm. to think about the problem at hand you know um yeah yeah it's uh, it's something I need to get better at is just giving I, I love doing things um and so I don't give myself that much time to to think just because I've I always want to do the next thing or do the mm. next thing, which is cool and it's good. But the problem with it is then you you don't have enough time to actually think over things mm. and to to reflect back on mm. things and to try and process them properly. Like, I mean, one of the things that you said earlier was um, with the other, this is one of the first books that you can read multiple chapters and feel like cool. It's, you can mm. actually read through them because they, they're short enough. And then you made the comment of for the other books, you sort of read a chapter and then you have to think over it because it's the longest mm. chapter. And that's, to me, that's actually a thing that I'd like to be able to get better at. Mm. Cause what I'll do is I'll read and then I'll either like put the book away and then I'll do the next thing but I often won't allow myself time to think oh. um, over it unless it's something like this. Oh. Where, But again, this is more doing something. Oh. Um, and so um, it's not that none of the ideas get absorbed, but a lot fewer of them. And you, you're able to make a lot less interesting connections if you... Well you're able to make more interesting connections if you give yourself the time to um, think. Oh. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay, one last comment on the casualties of perfection. This is sort of unrelated to the book, but I think it was a... For me, it was a cool oh. analogy. Or, oh, yeah. So, I... I often don't like to to wash the dishes because it's washing dishes um and when i do wash the dishes i do an extremely thorough job of it and it takes me maybe like say there's like a full um uh, basin of dishes it'll take me like maybe an hour to do the dishes um which gives more resistance because i know that i'm going to be standing there for an hour doing the dishes um, and I'll like rinse the plate before I wash it with a sponge because I don't want to get the sponge Spongy. too dirty and all kinds of things like that. And and I used to justify it because it's like, okay, well, I mean, like if you get the sponge dirty, you're going to have to throw away more sponges and like it's just sift to have things be dirty. And, and then Jamie is the opposite. She like washes the dishes in like an unbelievable speed. It's like... It's actually impressive. Oh, she doesn't particularly enjoy washing the dishes, but she's not bad at it. She's just like, it's like, yeah, it's fine. I'll, I'll do the dishes. So we try and do like 50-50, but I stand there for like an hour and she stands there for 10 minutes and we get the same amount of dishes done. And the her dishes often are, and, and she knows this, her dishes often aren't as clean as my, the dishes that I've washed because obviously I've spent way more time. But... I've lately been reflecting on it and I'm like, I am, I'm literally wasting my life washing dishes because most of the time the dishes that she washes are perfectly fine. Mm. And maybe there's like a little speck of something that you can just like if scratch dry, off or something, or, but it's the, like, they, they clean. It's not like they like extremely dirty. They just like have the little speck every now and again, every third plate or something like that. And, and I'm like, I, I realize, like, what am I doing? And so I'm still slow at washing dishes, but I'm faster. And I've learned from my wife. Um, yeah. Oh, gosh. And it's the same with um, folding clothes. Yeah. I was uh, listening to one of the, the guys on YouTube, The Primogen, and he was saying, like, he used to spend ages folding his clothes perfectly and packing them oh. neatly and stuff. And... Then he realized one day, like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I'm spending so much time and effort on mm-hmm. doing this thing and being perfect, but it's adding nothing mm. to my life, like nothing. 
it's not in my analogy it's not like the the cleaning of the dishes for the extra 50 minutes is gonna not get me sick or something Mm. like that from the little speck of dirt it she's jamie's lived up to the same age that i am she's healthier than me at this point um and so yeah it's i think that there's a lot of those kind of things Mm. where we could do that 80 20 rule um where we put we can put a a lot less effort in for the same result Mm. um casualties of perfection Mm -hmm. yeah I think the reason I was laughing so hard is because I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> That's what like, oh man. <sighs> yeah. No, it's uh, no, it's good thing to reflect on. <laughs> like it's something that there are certain things to keep peace. If other people are doing it, I actually have to be very far away. <laughs> you know, like I mean, I've had friends that say they can't cook with me in the kitchen. You know, That's how bad it. Like I mean. I wash my hands probably 50 Me too. times yeah. when I'm cooking. Like, everything I touch, I wash my hand. Like, mm. it's horrible. But, yeah, but like you said, like, other people who cook the same meal without having to wash their hands 50 times and yeah. you eat it and enjoy it the same way, you know, like, yeah. And you have to grapple with those things yeah. that you... and. Often, obviously, one wants to be like, no, I'm, of course, right. Mm. You should be washing the dishes more cleanly. <laughs> but, and, and initially, I was like that. I would, like, I obviously wouldn't be, like, nasty about it. Mm. But I'm like, and Jamie knew, like, okay, like, <laughs> her dishes aren't as clean as mine. But after thinking about it more, it's, in that situation, it's actually her that was right even though like practically if you had asked someone like would they prefer the cleaner dishes or the dirtier dishes of course they'd prefer the cleaner dishes but like i'd say not so clean dishes (laughs) 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 but But, but it's it's and and i mean there's lots of little things like that that i've learned about myself over time where i think i'm doing something right and then over time, I'm like, oh, okay, I was actually just just wasting time. time. And you think you it's the valuable thing to do, but it's not. It's the whole mm. cancer thing again. Like, mm. prevent the cancer. That's the most effective mm. way. Mm. But what we do instead is we spend years researching Achoo. how to Cure. treat the cancer. Mm. But if we had put all of those resources, time, and money into prevention, into the prevention it would be way better for humanity. But but we wash those dishes. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, on to the next one. It's supposed to be hard. So maybe I was right about the dishes. It should be an hour. should wash them. Um, everything worth pursuing comes with a little pain. The trick is not minding that it hurts. Yeah. It's... If... We, No, no, go for it. No, no, go for it. Well, I was just going to say, if we can accept that things are difficult Mm. and do them, rather than being like, oh, no, I don't want to do that because it's too difficult, or if a challenge comes up at work or in life, you're like, no, I don't want to do that. But rather accepting that things are going to be hard and then working through them, Mm. it'll make our lives... A lot easier and better. I think the the funniest part, I don't know if it was in this chapter where it talks about how the one guy that uh, sort of, you can put, performs like a magic trick of switching off uh, or turning off him, match with their, their fingers. Uh, and yeah, then, I think it is this. And then someone else is like, oh, let me try, let me try. And like, <laughs> they do it and then they scream. And then they're like, you know, how come, you know, he didn't scream? He's like, no, he anticipated the pain that comes yeah. with it, you know. So, And to me, that was like, that's actually what life is. You know, it's either you can scream at every discomfort we experience or kind of prepare ourselves to say life will be full of discomfort and mm. live through those when that, that time comes. Yeah. Know? And embrace... Embrace it to some extent. Mm. Like, it's, it, 
using the same example of the cold shower, like a a cold shower, if you are wanting to have a warm shower and things like that, then the cold shower can be terrible. Um, But if you embrace it and you're like, well, I'm doing this for for the betterment of my life Ooh. and things like that, then embracing a cold shower becomes not so bad. Ooh. It's not that it's super easy. Ooh. It's going to be hard. Yeah. Like showering in cold water is not fun. <laughs> yeah. But it, it can be made easier Ooh. because you can, like you say, you anticipate it. Ooh. It kind of goes back to the how emotions are made Ooh. thing where you, you get your brain aligned with what's going to happen yeah. um, and expecting that, yeah, it's not going to be super easy Ooh. all the time. Ooh. That's fine. Ooh. Yeah. Um, on page 126, uh, he's got a note from Charlie Munger. Yeah. So Charlie uh, Munger once noted, the safest way to try and get what you want is to try and deserve, is to try to deserve what you want. It's such a simple idea. It's the golden rule. You want to deliver to the world what you would buy if you were on the other end. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that's a lot of things in life. Mm. We tend to make them way more complicated than they need to be. Mm. But it's a, how do you become successful? Well, do things that are of value yeah. and you'll most likely become successful. Yeah. Whatever that means. It's Maybe you're an actor and you get good at acting and you on a show that people enjoy. Maybe you build a product. Maybe you write software. And if you... I guess if you pursue um, trying to to become amazing or something like that, you're probably going to fail. But if you pursue something that you're like, I would really want this thing, and then you go for that thing, uh, whether, again, it's creating something or acting or whatever, then most likely people will also enjoy it um, because... You, yeah, you worked on it, you accept that it's going to be difficult and you created something of value. You put in that effort. Oh. Um, but we often just want to make make things easy. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know why. Shortcuts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I think it's this book where it talks about that one story of um, <clears throat> there was a long route or perceived to be a long route and someone suggested mm. a shortcut and that actually took months longer than the four days they were trying to cut off you yeah. know um yeah like hundreds of people died or mm, something like that mm. we as humans you know always opt for the path of least resistance you know but yeah like chapters it's supposed to be hard yeah mm. it's like the um that idea of if it seems to be good to be true, it probably is. Um, and and ironically, at the same time, sometimes it is way better than it seems, but only if you've let it compound for like years and years and years and years, then you can look back and you'd be like, oh, wow, you're surprised at the exponential growth and compounding of, of what happened. But... If you expect instant stuff, then aside from like a instant gratification from Instagram or something like that, you're not gonna probably not gonna be satisfied. Oh. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, the wonders of the future. Um, the subtitle is it always feels like we're falling behind, and it's easy to discount the potential of new technology. So, this is um, the one about the light bulb that you mentioned. So, I'll just read a little bit about um, Edison. So, I think he has an interview with um, one of the uh, post editors. And then, essentially, he gets to the point where he says, or where they say, you believe then that the next 50 years will see as great a mechanical and scientific development as the past half century the post uh, queried Edison. Greater, much greater, he replied. Along what lines do you expect this development? They asked him. Along all lines. And then um, Morgan comments, 
This wasn't bland optimism. Edison understood the process of scientific discovery. Big innovations don't come at once, but rather build up slowly when several small innovations are combined over time. And then on the next uh, page, it says, um, for, Ed for Edison, for example, didn't invent the first light bulb. He just greatly improved upon what others had already built. In, 19, in 1802, three quarters of a century before Edison's light bulb, a British inventor named Humphrey Davy created an electric light called an arc lamp, choosing charcoal rods as a filament. It worked like Edison's light bulb, but it was impractically bright. You'd nearly go blind looking at it. And it could only stay lit for a few moments before burning out, so it was rarely used. Edison's contribution was moderating the bulb's brightness and longevity. That was an enormous breakthrough, but it was built on the backs of dozens of previous breakthroughs, none of which seemed meaningful in their own right. That's why Edison was so optimistic about invention. He explained, You can never tell what apparently small discovery will lead to. Somebody discovers something and immediately a host of experiments and innovators are playing all, vari all variations upon it. Um, yeah, there's on, on page um, 142, a last comment is, um, it says, yeah, the same thing today. Google Maps, TurboTax and Instagram wouldn't be possible without ARPANET a 1960s Department of Defense project linking computers to manage Cold War secrets, which became the foundation for the Internet. That's how you, got, that's how you go from the threat of nuclear war to filing your taxes from a couch, mm -hmm. a link that's unfathom, that was unfathomable 50 years ago. But there it is. Um, quick comment about TurboTax. There was a funny YouTube thing where oh, it's funny and sad. Apparently in America, TurboTax is actually, they've got like a free version, but most people pay for it okay. because TurboTax, the government was like, no, you have to make it a free version because the public legally is supposed to be able to file taxes. Mm. Um, and then the government's been trying to like create programs, uh, software programs for it and all kinds of things. And anyway, the, the point of the story is you can watch the YouTube thing on TurboTax at some point and it's interesting, but those those different inventions like Google Maps and Instagram, they basically you would have never predicted that nuclear war. Therefore, Instagram mm -hmm. like it's just not you're not going to ever no, make that you, connection. Yeah, and so yeah, the wonders of the future are hard to predict. Mm. Um, it's not all like correlation causation type of thing. Yeah, hard to. How to get the the correlation, or like you you think that um, it's a cause, mm. but looking back you like you can tie them up, but looking forward you don't know. Mm -mm. Is it correlation? Is it causation? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, and th then a, another interesting comment. So obviously he wrote this book, um, and so he had some comments on writing and stuff. And this was a interesting one on page 143. A book is far more than what the author wrote. It's everything you can imagine and read into it as well. I think that's a great comment because it's the same with most things where the discussions that you are having or the books that you're reading or the shows that you're watching or the experiences that you're having aren't only what they are they are also what you based off of them what you link to and what you piece together and stuff like that so the the thing that that quote was trying to pull at i think is you have these different innovations like nuclear bombs and stuff like that and then other people come across those things and then they build on that um, to end up making even more incredible things and more incredible things. An example is ChatGPT. So that has been for the past, I don't know, it's about 50 years back and forth of 
okay, cool, we've got this idea of back propagation and it's going to work really well and then um, people try it out and it doesn't work well and then other people try other things and then that works well and then Google eventually comes out with this attention is all you need paper and that starts working really well and all of a sudden, pretty much everything from generating images to understanding images to um, understanding languages, translation, um, voice recognition, um, generating texts, um, coherent text that can answer our questions and things like that. All of that, all of a sudden, bam, like it's all here now. But you think, okay, it was because of that Google paper. You know, no, mm. it was because of all of these different things mm. being pieced together over time. Mm. And no one of them, you could have been like, that's the thing. Mm. Um, and then you get to ChatGPT, and you're like, "Oh wow, this is something like super important." Mm. But it's not. But it's not. That wasn't. It wasn't like they went from zero to nothing. Yeah. They were building on all of these like sort of random mm. pieces. Mm. Um, I mean, to, same with uh, uh, the, the last book we did, the research of how emotions are made. Mm. You know, it's like they've been years and years of research on this thing this is not the first time research has been done in this area but you know just because this is one that's been well presented and people tend to gravitate to be like oh you were the first one to actually do research in that area yeah hmm. yeah it's Which not is her idea that our emotions are made it's <clears throat> building on a bunch of people Mm-hmm. But again, it goes back to the. I think they said the same thing about Darwin and that. Like, yeah, he, he, it's not. He's not the first person yeah. to come up with the I idea of evolution. About that. It's yeah. It's actually all a bunch of things that happened before, but he presented yeah. in a way that was palatable. Mm-hmm. Same with Yuval Noari. Um, yeah. So. Now you get it, Peter. Now you get it. <laughs> no, um, the next section on 152 is now you get it. So um, I should say before we get to now uh, um, to that one. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say this other one. Uh, harder than it looks and not as as fun as it seems. Um, mm-hmm. That was also a good uh, chapter, um, and that talks about how we always think. Or oh, the summer of it is the grass is always green on. The side that's fertilized with BS, yeah. <laughs> as they put it. But yeah, um, yeah. One of the story, or oh, yeah, it talks about how the one guy was complaining about how things are not going so well in his company, and uh, in his company, and he said it's poor a bit at the competitors' company, and. Uh, yeah. You know, the guy's response was like, no, the only reason you're able to identify those things is because you're in that system. If you mm-hmm. had to find someone in the other system, they probably would tell you the same thing. Yeah. You know, so it's just, it's very easy for us to think something's better if we're not in that situation, you know, or in mm-hmm. that environment. Um, so, yeah, I, I also thought that was... Um, an interesting chapter. It was a very short one. It was like four, four or five pages. Mm. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that we, it's, it's just helpful to think about that when you're looking for something better, mm. is it really going to be better? Yeah. Mm. Um, Cause most of the time, it's not, and it's not to say that you should never go and try it. Like, I mean, the classic mm. example is like going overseas or those kind of mm. things. Maybe it is actually for you in that particular situation, but for for people in general, they often think it's going to be way better, but it's just going to be different. Mm. Um, it's going to have problems still, uh, different problems maybe, but it'll still have mm. problems. And so, um, yeah, we we need to be realistic when we're looking at like what we want for the future and what we expect it to be like because from the outside everything looks all rosy yeah and you once you're on the inside he he says the line like then you know how the sausage is made and obviously the the sort of joke there is that sausage is normally just made of like random scraps of things just chopped up and 
put in a mess together mm. in a in a little I don't know what it's called, but mm-hmm. yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, and and I mean when we're in a certain company, we know how the sausage is made Ooh. and we know the messes that go into Ooh. things. Um, and then everyone else is like, this is great Ooh. when they're eating the sausage. Ooh. But like, um, it's not, not always that rosy. Yeah. Um, okay, then, so now you get it. 156. So it says here, nothing is more persuasive than what you've experienced firsthand. And there's a, a comment from Jim Carrey. So Jim Carrey, that the comedian actor guy, he once said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see it's not the answer. Then uh, Morgan comments on it. If you think that your future self living in a new mansion, if you think of your future self living in a new mansion, you imagine basking in splendor in the splendor and everything feeling great. What's easy to forget is that people in mansions can have the flu, can have thesaurus, I don't know what that is, um, become embroiled in lawsuits, bicker with their spouses, feel wrecked with insecurity and annoyed with politicians, which in any given moment can supersede the joy that comes from material success. Future fortunes are imagined in a vacuum But reality is always lived with the good and the bad taken together, competing for your attention. You might think that you know how you'll feel, how it'll feel. Then you experience it firsthand and you realize, ah, okay, it's more complicated than I thought. Yeah, we, especially with the wealth thing, we, we always think it's going to be better. But unfortunately not. Yeah. Can we go on to Time Horizons? Yeah. Okay, Okay, so 162, it says, um, Time Horizons, saying I'm in it for the long run is a bit like standing at the base of Mount Everest, pointing to the top and saying, that's where I'm heading. Well, that's nice. Now comes the test. And he makes a comment. Long-term thinking is easier to believe than to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, it's there's a lot of obstacles in the way. Yeah, um, you know, it gives a few like family idea and, and things like that. You need to be aligned with the people around you, work colleagues, family, mm. all of those kind of things if you want to have career success. Um, and he gives a few of them. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean naturally, I think we know that <coughs> it's. It's a lot easier to say I'm I'm in it for the long run. Yeah. Then when your I don't know marriage gets difficult or your work gets difficult or something like that. At the first sign, you're like I'm out of here. Type exactly. Of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is sad. Yeah. No, I think what caught me there was on one sixty four about patience is often stubbornness in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I'm like, oh, you know. Yeah. I thought I was patient. <laughs> Others viewed us being stubborn. I mean, I've been caught stubborn a few times, so I think I guess I know where it comes <laughs> from. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to confuse the two. You think that, that you are being patient when you're actually just being stubborn. Mm. That's, yeah. Mm. Got to watch out for ourselves. Yeah. Um. Yeah, the, towards the end of the, the chapter on 166, he says, another point about long-term thinking is how it sways the information we consume. I try to ask when I'm reading, will I care about this in a year from now, in 10 years from now, in 80 years from now? It's fine if the answer is no, even a lot of the time. But if you're honest with yourself, you may begin to steer towards the more enduring bits of information. And then later he says, but, um Permanent information is harder to notice because it's buried in books rather than blasted in headlines, but its benefit is huge. It's not just that permanent information never expires, letting you accumulate it. It also compounds over time, leveraging off what you've already learned. So, yeah, the, the, the title, again, is Time Horizons. And when we are dealing with different things, 
we we don't really often think about the long term and the 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 implications of what we're doing right now and what they are for the long term. Um, and so we'll hop jobs often or we'll do this or that. And in reality, there's nothing specifically wrong with going from one job to another, especially if it advances the career or life in the way that you are aiming to. Mm. But if you're just doing it for more money or those kind of things, when you don't particularly need more money, if you if you do, then fine. Mm. Like go to the job that gives you more money if you desperately need it. But if you don't desperately need it, then assess, is this really the impact? Is this really going to have the impact that I want it to have? Or am I just consuming Twitter yeah. instead of, I don't know, reading about Plato or something? Um, mm. Most of the time, we're just consuming Twitter. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, there's valuable information there on Twitter or whatever, but it's just the you have to sift through so much yeah. to get the valuable information that yeah, is it really worth it? Hard to say. Yeah, I can't that work out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay, should we go through it for the last one? Yeah. Trying too hard. Yeah. This is yeah, also one of my favorites. I think before I forgot have we mm. gone past the incentive one? Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, I'll tell you one forty nine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to speak quickly about it how it was it was quite interesting how it spoke. You you'd be surprised what people are willing to do for the right incentive. You know, I think yeah. for me that was, um, um, I mean, I've always known, but it, I've never thought about it in, in that much depth, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it talks about how, uh, was that one drug dealer who, uh, a chapo who would be yeah. like, you know, find people preparing for a wedding and they'll tell the father of the bride to be like, oh, I'll pay for the wedding mm -hmm. and expect that person to say terrible things about him. You know, just yeah. what happened. Um, yeah, he pays for the wedding and then they basically celebrate him mm -hmm. even though they know that that oh, he's the, the drug lord, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, but it's because he did something nice for them. Mm -hmm. And so then the incentive is to be nice back to him. Yeah. And so they have his back, mm. even though on a and, broader scale. And I mean, working. it even goes on to say not all incentives are monetary. They're even like um, culture incentives, you know, mm. and we overlook those. Um, but yeah, yeah, I just wanted to circle back to that because I, I just thought it was, it could I, like, one of the best points that you put across you mm. know um hmm. yeah and if 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 we reflect truthfully on things i often think not often but i, I sometimes think about like terrorism and that and if i would be able to be a terrorist given the right in that case it would be more cultural incentive mm. where you you brought up in a certain environment and you um you brought up to believe that if you do this, then it's for the better of um, your beliefs and, and that. And yeah, like that, that's how your mind is shaped. Mm. And it's tempting to be like, no, I could never be. And sitting here now, I'm like, I can't imagine mm. ever even conceiving of being capable of doing something like that. Um, but given the right, cultural incentives and like background being raised in certain ways and things like that, would you really be any different? Mm. And I mean, like most of the time we think of people like terrorists and that as being the worst of us, mm. murderers and terrorists and things like that. And um, yeah, and, and it's quite possible that your average person in the wrong situation could end up being a terrorist. Mm. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's um, uh, incentives. Yeah, what a question. Why we do the things that we do? Hmm. 
Okay. Trying too hard. So, yeah, again, like I said earlier, I think this is a really, really good one because it just, it's the same idea as the compounding yeah. and the um, the overcomplicating things and that. So, trying too hard, it says here, there's no points awarded for difficulty. Yeah. And then he says, let's discuss an enduring quirk of human behavior, the allure of complexity, intellectual stimulation, and discovering things that are simple but very effective in preference to things that are complex but less effective. So, or discounting the things that are simple, not discovering, sorry. Discounting the things that are simple but effective in preference to the things that are complex but less effective. So we've, I don't think we'll discuss it much but because we already did a bit yeah. with the, the cancer thing. Um, yeah. If, um, if we are thinking about the things that we do, often we try extremely hard for things and, and at the end of the day, I mean, if we go back to the idea of software development, both you and our software developers, and if we look at that, and if you worked for a week on something and it was extremely difficult to figure out and eventually you figure it out and, and that, and at the end of the day, the result is like a button that you can click. The client or the customer is like, oh, I can click the button. Mm. I'm happy mm. that I can click the button and it does the thing that I mm. wanted to do. But the fact that it was super complicated or you Im Im implemented this incredible thing behind the scenes is neither here nor there. Oh, yeah. And sometimes you have to implement that like really difficult thing. But very often what we'll do is we'll overcomplicate things because we want to sound fancy, mm. but it's just unnecessary. Mm. So try and prevent the cancer rather than cure it because mm. that's the more helpful thing to do. Mm. I mean, for those doing cancer treatment stuff, don't stop, but <laughs> <laughs> we need that too. <laughs> but it's uh, more focus on the mm. other side is, mm. is a really good idea. Yeah. Um, sorry, there was actually one last one. I forgot about the, the last the wounds heal, scars last. Yeah. Uh, so that that's the last chapter, and he says, um, "What you've this?" And these are two questions that he gives. What have you experienced that I haven't? That makes you believe what you do? Mm. And would I think about the world like you do if I experienced what you have? Mm. Um, and that reminds me of that the terrorist idea like if you what things have you experienced that shaped your reality and if i had experienced those same things would my reality be, be shaped in that same way mm. um and it's difficult to say no I, I read that section of the book and i feel like i, I do agree you know because like this is actually on like personal reflection i, I feel like my Mindset 15 years ago and my mindset now are very different. Mm. And this is as a result of me. I mean, I've spent what now? Uh, close to 12 years in SA. Yeah, and like, I know that there's certain things I do now that are a result of me living in this country mm. that and the way i think about certain things has changed from if you had to ask me the same thing 12 years ago yeah you know so i do believe that and again it's the same as uh, shared experiences people that have shared an experience traumatic or not relate better than people that have never experienced that at all Mm. And that experience is what the scar is. It's that constant reminder of what you've been through, mm. you know. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I I agree with him that mm. if if people and I mean, it's the same as kids, not even kids, adults raised in different parts of the world, there will be differences, and that's because the experiences are. Are different, yeah, you know, 
but then have those uh, or you can have people from two nations move to one country and then have their kids raised in you know the same space their kids would be most more similar more more alike you know mm. because they were raised in the same environment yeah um, regardless of who their parents are mm-hmm. mm. yeah. yeah it's true that's just my thought on that yeah we shape by the world around us and, mm. and it, there's no way around it mm. um we are like human beings that live in community mm. and do things in mm. we're, around other people in relation to other people mm. um and so those the cultural incentives are massive mm. um yeah it's a fascinating idea mm. and morgan would say it's the same as it's always been <laughs> <laughs> same as ever yeah. yeah yeah so any last reflections peter no just uh Grab yourself a copy <laughs> yeah. and read the book. Uh, I don't think we do most of these books the just if they deserve, but we try. Yeah. So, yeah, you can grab yourself a copy and read it for yourselves. And, yeah, maybe just be reassured of some of the thoughts you might already have. You know, it's, like you said, it's not always about new ideas. It's mm. about adding to the well of knowledge that you already might have, you know. Yeah. Mm. Or just being exposed in mm. a different way so that you can make new com- connections yeah. and have those, in quotes, innovative thoughts. Mm. Even though they're not completely new, yeah. mm. they are still building in interesting ways yeah. that are helpful. Yeah. Um, and I think that having these kind of discussions helps with that mm. because we're forced to to think through them and try and hash out thoughts mm. um yeah cool all right thanks peter thanks james until next time cool cheers cheers <laughs>